Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are back. We are excited. Commanders Nation, it's your boy Young Rome and your man Bryce. Uh, we got a lot to get into. Training camp is underway. Um, the sale is is final. Dan is gone. Josh Harris and Magic Johnson and company are officially the owners of the Washington Commanders. Uh, potential reband, uh, name change, all that. Lots to get into. Uh, so let, let's just kick it off, man. Let's kick it off. Get right into it, Bryce. Dan Snyder's out. Josh Harris is in. It's a happy day, happy week, happy month. I believe Josh Harris has been the owner for about five days now, and I think I've seen more people in Redskins and Commanders gear in the past five days than I have in the past five years. Uh, so wh wh what's it like on your side? I know I'm out here in VA. You're over there in Maryland. How's the vibe in Maryland now that we got new owners? PG County's loving it, bro. PG is loving it, man. Everybody's wearing their skin and stuff. And I only live about maybe a 10-minute walk max to the stadium. And everybody around my uh, around my area is wearing this stuff, man. It, it, it's lit. It's lit. People got that pride back. Uh, we're going to see how long it lasts. But uh, I think it didn't matter who the owner was. As long as Dan was gone, people were going to be happy. Facts, facts. We've said it on this show before. Uh, pretty much anybody but Dan. I think it's a bonus that we got someone uh, with a good track record like Josh Harris and uh, someone that's very likable in Magic Johnson. I don't know if you've seen the video of Magic down there dancing to the go-go. Uh, Dan Snyder would have never been dancing to go-go. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we got some owners that are actually for the people. I've seen uh, video clips and pictures of Josh Harris signing autographs, uh, things that Dan Snyder would have would have never even done. So, I mean, it's it's truly a new day uh, for the Washington Commanders uh, with this new ownership group. I couldn't agree more, man. And it's, that's all it takes sometimes, just getting out with the old and in with the new. And uh, it's definitely giving a new sense of uh, pride to the fan base, like I said earlier. Now, how long that will last, we don't know. And uh, what moves they'll make, we don't know. Like, to your point, they talking about changing the name, changing the branding. Who knows what direction they're going with that? There is a chance they could lose some of that support if they don't make these moves the right way. So uh, they've got to be careful with the way they the way they maneuver. This fan base has been through so much that it's it's to the point where the same way that this 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 ownership change set off you know a whole bunch of new pride in the fan base. I think the wrong move with the name, or even if they were to change the colors or anything like that, could have the adverse effect. And uh, Josh Harris could go from the the darling to the to the hated very very quickly so it hopefully makes the right moves man we'll see i agree man it could this is a fickle stand fan base and it could it could go like that and snap of a finger um me personally i don't really want to see another rebrand i don't I, like i'm trying to get used to the commanders it's not my favorite name in the world um i was i kind of liked washington football team a lot too to be honest but the last five seasons like i said we've had three different names so another another name change to me is a bit of a turnoff uh, but he did say that it's not about, you know, what he thinks is about what the what the fan base overall thinks. Um, so it, it'll be interesting because I know a lot of the fan base, a big portion of our fan base is not cool with the name Commanders. But I think some some playoff wins could, could sway some people. Now, that's a fact. That's a fact. And like to your point, that Commander's name to a lot of people probably represents Dan Snyder. because That's the last major move he made as the owner. You know what I mean? That was his last hurrah, was changing the name from Redskin or to from football team to Commanders. So you do wonder if that, if Josh Harris and company are viewing that as, you know, sign of the old, right? Uh, uh, the mark of Dan, that Commander's name. I don't love the Commander's name. Has it grown on me a little bit? I think any name would have grew on me, though. Uh, to your point, I like Washington football team as well. I'm not mad at that name. Uh, but I feel like you go back to that, it's kind of like moving backwards, right? Uh, yeah. And changing name at all is kind of like, here we go again. The only one, the only way I could say, like, I'm on board with the name change if it starts with the word red. You feel me? Because then that kind of gets us back to our origins. I was a big, a big proponent of the Red Wolves name. I would have loved Damn. us to be the Red Wolves right now. So to me, that's the only, it's Red Wolves or Bus. I don't even really want to hear any other names. I hear people floating out hogs. I'm good on hogs. I can just see people making the memes now about us being a hog. I don't want no part of that. Um, the only one I'm really cool with is red wolves or red something. Uh, so they, they got a lot to figure out. If that's really what they want to do. But like I said, it's got to be the right name. And if they're going to actually ask the fan base, go with what the fan base told you. 
or tells you, unlike what Dan did. Dan asked the fan base, then went with some shit that was totally different than what the fan yeah. base said. Yeah, uh, Commanders was out of left field. Commanders definitely fought out of left field. Yeah. And uh, to your to your point earlier, man, like I think the bigger thing as a true Washington fan uh, is the color scheme. Um, everyone hated the, the commander's name, but the fact that they tried to keep the burgundy and gold is what kept people, you know what I mean? Like, oh, maybe I'll warm up to it or whatever. But like to to change the colors in any way, and I'm saying this as a lifelong, and you know me, lifelong Washington fan, if you change the colors, that's going to cut deep. That's going to be the thing, like you were saying, where Harris could go from, you know, being the most beloved owner to one of the most hated real fast. Um so I, I get what you're saying. There's a lot to it. The commander name kind of does have a dance cider attachment to it, and they might want to move forward from that. But um, burgundy and gold is 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 what this what this area uh, recognizes and and what always needs to be uh, associated with the team, in my opinion. Agreed. And at this point, that's all we really got. That's all we really got holding us together is the burgundy and gold. I mean, there's no other unifying thing when it comes to the team. Uh, it's just burgundy and gold. That's that's it. Honestly. That might have to be the name. <laughs> the Washington <laughs> Burgundy and Gold. Let's get it, bro. <laughs> I ain't mad at that. Hey, Josh Harris and company, man. You heard it here first. Burgundy and Gold. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be mad at that. We were just the Burgundy and Gold. Like, let's get it. <laughs> hey, so let's get the owner talk real quick. It's great that we got the new owners, but let's let's get here for what we're really here for, man. Some some football talk. Because camp is finally here. Uh, we've been waiting months and months and months for some NFL football. And, and it's underway, man. Camp is, is in full swing. Uh, from what I've seen on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now, the fan base is in full force. I plan to go up to camp uh, here in a few days myself, uh, and it looks like I'm going to have to be arriving early uh, and ready because the fans are, are packing that thing out. Uh, but, Bryce, I'm going to ask you, man, what are a couple things that you're going to keep your eye on during this training camp? Because there's, you know, there's a ton from Chase, Chase Young coming back from injury, uh, Sam Howe, Jacoby Brissett. Running back room, how's that looking? The offense as a whole is going to be interesting. Uh, so, yeah, Bryce, what, what stands out to you the most, and what are you going to be keeping a close eye on uh, during the month of August? Yeah, to your point, the first thing that stands out, of course, is the quarterback is Sam Howell. We're going to get into Sam a little later, so I'm not going to dive too deep into that right now. But uh, there are a couple of battles that I'm, I'm looking out for. Um, I've been watching – I've been, you know, having my eyes on Twitter too, and I'm seeing uh, a lot of people talk about this Garrett Wilson versus Sauce Gardner battle up in New York, right? I think we got our own that's going to be developing this training camp between Terry McLaurin versus Emmanuel Forbes. Uh, I'm high on Emmanuel Forbes. He was actually my number two rated corner uh, right after Ball from uh, from Illinois, right after Witherspoon. So I had before the draft, I had Forbes as my second rated corner. So when the skins took him, I was elated, bro. And uh, I really think he can come in and be one of those top guys sooner than later. Uh, hopefully battling Terry McLaurin uh, play after play only makes him better. And I've been peeping some of those battles. It's been impressive on both sides. Uh, so that's one battle I'm looking out for. To your point with Chase, Chase got the brace off now. That's a big thing, man. There was a lot of talk when Chase came out last season wearing that brace. A lot of people were discussing, they were discussing that on the radio, how bulky the brace was. Not only does Chase have the brace off, but Logan Thomas does as well. So I'm hoping that both of those guys bounce back from injury and look like themselves. Uh, one more one more training camp uh Couple, one more guy I'm really going to be watching out for in training camp, um, one more battle, I should say, is this linebacker position. We've been, like, going back and forth with the linebacker position for the last few years now. We haven't really figured it out. We've had some jags in there, man. I mean, from David <laughs> Mayo to, uh, to, to to the guy everyone hates, John Bostic. Uh, last year, you know, the leader in the, in the linebacker room was Cole Holcomb. He's kind of been the leader over the last two or three seasons. But he's gone now. And it's, it's, it's up to Jamin David to really make that leap. We did sign Barton, Cody Barton, over the offseason. So we got to see what he can do. But one guy I'm really excited to see, and I think he will emerge, is Kalik Hudson. I'm high on Kalik Hudson. I thought when he played last year in the Dallas game, he was very impressive. It wouldn't shock me if our new addition, Cody Barton, is not a starter come game one. And instead, we see Jamin Davis next to Kalik Hudson, a uh, man in that, uh, that two-man linebacker, that two-man starting uh, linebacker. So... We'll see how that works out. But uh, linebacker is one position, a dark horse position. I don't think no one's really focused on, but I really got my eyes on during camp. Yeah, no, line, I'm glad you brought linebacker up because that's, that's where I was going to go. Um, Jamin Davis, I believe, had a small injury during during the summer offseason programs. 
And I believe he started with the twos uh, yesterday at camp. So the linebacker position will be interesting because I don't I don't think Cody Barton is going to be a day one starter either. I don't see him out there starting week one. Um, but to your point, Cole Holcomb was pretty much the leader and statistically for the better half of the season. And he only played about a half, two thirds of the season. So with him gone, it's Jamin Davis or bust, in my opinion. Like we drafted this guy as a first round pick. Um and he has not lived up to it. I've been critical of him on here plenty of times. So for me, I'm looking for a big, big season from Jamin Davis. Um, I think right now him starting with the twos is really more so about him just getting his feet back under him, getting his, you know, his legs under him, getting everything back to where it needs to be. But uh, we just re-signed Deron Payne. We got John Allen up front. We know what those two Alabama boys do. They're going to keep blockers off Davis. Davis has to be able to read, react, and make plays, man. Like, there's there's really no excuses for uh, Jamin Davis um, at this point because we know what that D-line can do. And to your other point about Chase Young not having the brace off or having the brace off, that is uh, one of the biggest thing, non-quarterback things to me that I'm watching this camp. Um is how Chase moves. I want to see him in some preseason games. When I go up to camp, I'm going to be keeping an eye on Chase as well. Uh, just to just to see how he's – no limp, no hesitation. Is he back back? Because this is going to be a huge season for him in a contract year. As we know, they didn't renew the uh, fifth-year option. So I'm looking at Chase, and I'm like, you, know, you got to get like 10, 12 sacks minimum. You know what I mean? Like you really got to be an impact player. So him, him and Jamin Davis, man, first-round picks – they got to make some impact plays this season and it starts in camp. Uh, but the number one thing I'm keeping my eye on that doesn't involve a quarterback is what you already said too: Terry versus Emmanuel Forbes. I used to play DB Forbes is to me has the potential to be right up there with sauce Gardner. He's a gambler, but he's a smart gambler. And you know, this from, from studying him, he takes calculated risks. He's a lot of people think, Oh, you know, he's the type that just jumps the ball, might get beat from what I've read about him and heard from former coaches. He studies the tape. So he's not just jumping a play because he's guessing. He's jumping the play because he knows what's about to happen. And that's a big difference uh, from, from gambling. So if he, can, if he can get acclimated in the NFL, get up to speed, and be ready for the – I'm sure they're going to hit him with double moves because he's an aggressive corner. But if he can be ready for those type of things and, and keep pace, and I think he's our best corner right now. Like I'd put him above BSJ and Kendall Fuller. So that was a great draft pick, and I'm very interested to see uh, how he pans out. Uh, but, yeah, are there, are, the other thing, too, that I don't think you mentioned that I am going to keep an eye on, though, is the O-line. I believe Shadiq Charles started at left guard, uh, and that'll be interesting how that pans out because the O-line, I think, is our weakest spot on offense. And as we both know, that could crumble the entire thing. That could. And I know that Eric Bieniemy is very, very high on Sadiq Charles. So this is Sadiq's opportunity, man. Sadiq Charles, for, for all that's been talked about with him, you know, he's been he was a third round pick, hasn't really materialized yet. But the kid is only 24 still. So a lot of football in front of him. Uh, and if you've ever seen his calf muscles, he got calves of a uh, of an all pro. All right. So if he could play up to the, the, the size of his calves, it, it'll be what we need. Uh, the one 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 other guy that I uh, one other position battle i will have my eye on uh, i've been watching pretty closely thus far is running back uh we got antonio gibson who's also going into a contract year so this is a major year for antonio gibson uh last year brian robinson showed pretty well coming after you know that injury where he was shot um and then you know we also got the young boy chris rodriguez came in um uh, so i mean we, we've got some we've got some backs out there and it'll be interesting to see how Eric Bieniemy decides to deploy his backs. Um, right now, it looks like Brian Robinson is going to be the lead back with uh, Antonio Gibson kind of playing that third down back role. Uh, but I am interested to see how that, that position battle um, plays out. That's another one I'll be watching closely, especially with Gibby being in a, in a contract year. You know, I know Gibson's going to want his carries. He's going to want his touches. But if you watch last year, you know, the way that the Chiefs used Jarek McKinnon, that's perfect for Antonio Gibson, right? Yeah. Uh, that's really perfect for Antonio Gibson. And if he can get a few carries a game, but, you know, have more receptions per game than carries, he could be in a really good spot uh, heading into free agency. So that's another that's another position battle I am watching closely is that RB. And, you know, receivers, another one, too. Like we have we have we have some holdovers at the receiver position that are on the bubble right now. Like Dax Mill, definitely on the bubble. I mean, we brought in uh, Marcus Kemp from from KC. And this week we just signed Byron Pringle from KC. Byron Pringle is a guy who can also return kicks. Uh, yeah. Marcus Kemp is a guy who plays Gunner, who, who's a special team savant. So you're looking at two guys that, to me, 
are locks to make that to, to make the roster. So not only are we looking at Dax Milne on the bubble, but hey, Deami Brown got to have a good camp because they play only only keeping five receivers. You think about Terry, Jahan, and Curtis as locks. The two yeah. guys that Eric Bieniemy just brought in and Kemp and Pringle that leaves uh, that would leave uh, Deami Brown as the odd man out. So Deami's got to come out there and ball out. Um, luckily for him, he's playing with his old uh, college quarterback, so that should help a little bit. Yeah, man. Um... It's funny that you mentioned the receivers because we got the three locks at the top. And then after that, it's kind of a crapshoot. Uh, I do think Pringle makes his team. I think they got him before the returning, which to me puts Dax right on out because he was the returner last year. And uh, if you can't beat out Pringle, then I don't really see a roster spot for him. Uh, but the running backs will definitely be interesting. I think Antonio Gibson is going to have a big year. I think the enemy is going to put him in, in – much better positions than Scott Turner did. I think Scott Turner tried to get creative, but it didn't seem like it was it was really flowing. Uh, but I think based off of what we've seen with Kansas City, that if, if Gibson can get down with Eric Bieniemy is picking up, then or put down what he's picking up, then I think he'll be he'll be a Pro Bowl level uh, player. To be honest, um, ooh, that's a big time prediction. It, it is. It is a big time prediction. But I I I think. Gibson and Curtis Samuels will will be very key pieces in an Eric Bieniemy offense. Um, and to your point earlier about Logan Thomas, if he's all the way healthy, I think he'll also be a a, a big piece um, in this Commanders offense as well, with Terry and Jahan hitting big plays down the field. Uh, yeah, but let, let's go real ahead. Real quick, before we move on, okay. I want to get back to that running backs really quick. Um, when 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 the Commanders drafted Chris Rodriguez in the sixth round. That screamed Eric Bieniemy pick to me. Uh, not only is Chris Rodriguez like not uh, necessarily a Ron Rivera style running back. If you look at Ron Rivera's history, you know he usually goes for speedier guys. Um, but Chris Rodriguez is an Eric Bieniemy style running back based off what Eric, type of player Eric Bieniemy was when he was coming out of Colorado, right? A bruiser, low to the earth. You know what I mean? Grinding for extra yardage. So a part of me feels like Chris Rodriguez is a lock to make that running back uh, make that running back room. Um, so. That even takes away more carries for Gibson. Now, if Gibson ends up having anywhere near a Pro Bowl type of season, I think that means like that we are a top ten to fifteen offense in the league. Because once you once you're able to like have that type of, in my opinion, only the best offenses have that um, that back that's catching you know hundred balls, right? Mm -hmm. Only the elite offenses have that. So if you can get you a back that's catching you know let's say 70 to 90 balls, I think we're looking at a top 15 offense in, in, in this year for the commander. So that, that that's a big prediction from you. But if it, if it comes true, I think we're going to have a serious offense this year. Yeah, I think Gibson's definitely going to go crazy. I think the the, the main worry for me uh, on offense is the O-line. And, of course, our next topic, the quarterback position. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into Sam Howell, man. Like, I know, you know, the hardcore fans are definitely aware of who Sam Howell is, right, fifth-round quarterback. Uh, my son's mom, not not so much of a hardcore fan. You know, I showed her a picture of Sam Howell the other day, asked her who that was, and she was like, is that Jack Harlow? <laughs> so hopefully Sam can get out here, win us some games, and uh, be a, a super recognizable face to all the fans. Uh, but the work starts now. Um, you know, the national media kind of clowning it. Like, oh, you guys got a fifth-round pick. I think his, his, his rating on Madden is like a 66 uh, so if you're not close to this team, if you're not, you know, deep in, in, in the trenches and paying attention to everything, you're probably looking at Sam Howell as the starter and you're looking at this team crazy, right? So, Bryce, can you explain why it's not as crazy as, you know, the national media or, you know, some fans that haven't been paying close attention? Uh, why, why why is it not so crazy that Sam Howell is, is coming into camp as the starter? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, first thing you got to do is is turn on the, the UNC tape, right? Uh, Sam Howe, when he had those weapons, uh, Javon Williams, uh, what's the other running back that came out? He, Michael Carter, um, and he had uh, De'Ami Brown. They had another receiver, two other receivers. That One that will get drafted next year will go pretty high, and one more receiver whose name was escaping me. But when he had all his weapons at UNC, he was killing it, bro. He was killing it. Um, and he was predicted to be a top three pick in the 2022 draft. And then what happened is, all his weapons left, right? And what did Sam Howell do without those weapons? He only ran for about a thousand yards that season. You know what I mean? So he he showed that he can compensate in other ways, right? Um, but his passing numbers did dip, uh, which which would let him to fall to us in the fifth round. So the question becomes, which Sam Howell are you getting, right? Um, the commanders seem to think you're getting a Sam Howell that showed those flashes in the Dallas game. You turn that turn on that Dallas tape. 
only a small handful of bad plays. Obviously, there was the bad pick in the end zone and then a couple other errant throws. But for the most part, man, Sam Howe showed that he had great command over his deep ball. He also showed that he can uh, put the ball in places where only his receiver can catch it. And that's one thing I, show, I, was, I saw from him a whole lot at UNC. Now, the other interesting part of this that I think people are sleeping on is the, the mesh between Sam Howe and Eric Bieniemy, which in my opinion works very, very well. Number one reason for that is Sam Howe came from an RPO system at UNC. And I don't know if anyone ran as many RPOs in the NFL as the Chiefs did last season, right? Uh, that's what Eric Bieniemy does. That's what the Chiefs do. So I think that's one thing that will be a, a pretty smooth adjustment for Sam Howe coming into this Eric Bieniemy offense. By all accounts, he looked great on day one, day one of training camp. By all accounts I've heard. And uh, even the clips I watch, I mean, he was looking very, very accurate. Sam Howe, for anyone that doesn't know, a little bit of background, Sam Howe's father was uh, his high school coach, right? So Sam Howe is the son of a coach. Whenever I see that, that excites me. Uh, yeah. From all accounts, Sam Howe, it, Sam Howe was the man at UNC. You're the quarterback at UNC, you are the man. And apparently he didn't care about being out partying, being out with the girls, doing things like that. He had one girlfriend during college, put his head down and focused on football. That's another thing I love to see. Sam Howe seems to me to be a football junkie. If he is a football junkie, that's a box check that a lot of quarterbacks, uh, you know, fa fail at. You know what I mean? So uh, I'm excited to see it, bro. I think Sam Howe is the guy, man. I think he is the guy. And I feel like with Dan Snyder leaving, it's just like the stars are aligning. Like it couldn't be more perfect that we found a franchise quarterback in the fifth round and uh, Snyder's gone like, the opportunity is endless right now. And I really do believe that Sam's going to run with it. I just hope they give him that opportunity. And to me, the, my favorite thing about Sam, outside of his ability to make every throw, of course, put the ball where it needs to be, is his toughness, man. The kid is tough as hell, bro. And he knows how to relate. That's another thing that I think gets taken for granted um, that, that some quarterbacks lack. And Sam knows how to relate to his position and his skill, guys. You know what I mean? He knows how to relate to everybody. And I think that's probably – Outside of just physical skills, that's the number one intangible that a quarterback has to have. You got to be able to relate to everyone, any leader, honestly. You got to be able to relate to your constituents. And I think Sam Howe can do just that. So, man, I'm fired up about Sam, bro. I think it's going to work and I think he's going to find a way. So, I, I really can't wait for the season, man. Yeah, I agree, man. I learned a lot about Sam this summer. Uh, like you said, his, his dad's a coach. And I, I thought that was a very, a very interesting thing because they share a bond through football. So, that leads me to believe that he, even if he's not a football junkie, he's very much into the X's and O's, the game, uh, and studying. And I listening to him talk on the press conference yesterday was also very interesting because uh, he said something. I think he got asked a question about the Netflix show Quarterbacks and if he would be interested in doing something like that this season. And his response, I thought, was perfect because he was like, you know, those guys have been in the league for a few seasons, you know, um, so they, they have their routines down, all that. He's like, I'm still, you know, getting acclimated, learning. So he's like, that, that wouldn't be something that I would want to do this season. And that right there was a great answer because it lets me know he's locked in. He realizes the opportunity in front of him. And he doesn't seem rattled because they also asked him about what I said, the national media, people looking at us crazy for starting a fifth-round pick. And he's not worried about what they're saying because he's, he's saying that he's got to stay locked in and stay focused. That's another great answer uh, from someone who could potentially be the franchise quarterback. Me, personally, I need to see a bit more. I've watched that Dallas game at nauseum. I've watched the film at nauseum. And you're right. There's really only a few plays where it's like, yeah, you know, and the rest of it, it's like, man, like, this guy should have been a lot higher than the fifth round, to be honest. So I like Sam Howell. I think he's much better than, you know, the, nas the overall national take on him is. But uh I just need to see a little bit more. Like you said, the, the by all accounts, day one in training camp has gone exactly how it should be. Uh, we'll see day two, three, and four. And um, I got to see some preseason games. It Once the regular season starts, I feel like our first game is the Cardinals and the second game is Denver. Once we play Buffalo, that'll tell me everything I really need to know about Sam after those first three games. Um you said it's potentially the franchise quarterback. That's a big, bold prediction. Prediction. You think Sam is not only our – because we know – but we both know. We talked about the ownership. A lot will be different this time next year. We got a lot of guys on contract years. A uh, new owner could mean a new coach. We talked about potentially a new name. I think this time, 2024, a lot could be different, and that might include the quarterback position. 
Uh, so I'm not as sold on Sam Howell right now as you are, but I do think he could change my mind over the course of training camp and preseason. Yeah, I, I'm sold on Sam, bro. I'm sold on Sam. And this, this is one more reason I'm going to give you um, as to why I'm sold on Sam. Since Ron Rivera's got here, he's tried just about every method of getting a quarterback, right? Um, he tried the free agent method. He tried the trade method. He tried to call all 32 teams and see who's available method. Right. So Ron has tried everything he can do to get a quarterback. I do not think that Ron Rivera is an idiot. Right. I really don't think he's an idiot. Um, some people do think he's an idiot, but I'm not in that camp. Right. So with me not believing Ron is an idiot, Ron must know. He must know that he, this is an audition for him. Right. So the only way that Ron can fail as in during the season and still pass the audition, right, is if Sam Howe sh proves and shows that he is a franchise quarterback, right? I don't think Ron Rivera um, and company, which includes now Eric Bianini, but of course, you know, we, you've got a very, very well-respected quarterback coach and Ken Zampezi and mm -hmm. other offensive assistants. I don't think they hitched their wagon to Sam Howe unless Sam showed them everything they needed to see to confirm that he is that guy. And that's another reason why that makes me even more sure that Sam is the guy because you've got football minds that have been watching him now for over a year, and they're like, yeah, we don't need to go in free agency and, sp and splash. Yeah, Derek Carr's available, but we don't need to chase that. Yeah, you know, we, you know, you see, I mean, yeah, Andy Dalton's there, but we don't need that this year. We've, we've tried that route. They're good on what they've got, and to me that shows a certain level of confidence in what they got. And I think they're, I think they're a lot more confident in Sam than they're letting on because I think if they let it on too early, they show their hand, and then maybe they do like end up looking like idiots, right? So, um, but I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't be more excited for Sam Howe in that in that game against e the Eagles, man. I'm sorry, in that game against Dallas, when Dallas was still playing for something, right? They they were still playing for for playoff positioning. Sam showed me what I needed to see, bro, and it was what he did at USC. Think about it like this: the deep ball to Terry was perfect. And that was a big yeah. time catch. But what people forget about is the deep ball to Jahan, which was yep. perfect. And Jahan Dotson doesn't really drop that ball, but somehow he was unable to track it and drops that ball. But that Terry, was, Terry and Jahan had a had a bad drop in that game, which was very yeah, unlikely. He went on the crosser, right? Yeah, he had a bad drop, but that's that's like one in a hundred. But if if Jahan Dotson catches that deep that deep pass from uh, Sam, that's another what maybe 50, 60 yards adding on to yeah. his total. And we're and people are looking at that game way different if it's a three hundred yard game versus a two hundred. Yeah, yard yeah. The game national, yeah, the national media would have taken that in oh, a little different. It's being looked at way different. Imagine Jahan takes that and runs it to the crib. Now it's a two touchdown game versus a one touchdown game. And then the last thing I'll say about that game is that run into the end zone, boy. That run, yeah. where he trucked that man at the goal line, bro, and flexed on everybody. That's the same how I saw it, saw at UNC. And that's the type of player that the rest of the team will rally behind. It, I wouldn't be surprised if the if the rest of the team has an utmost confidence in Sam right now, too. I think as the training camp goes on, we're going to hear more and more glowing uh, glowing reports about, about Sam Howe. I can't wait to get it started because I want to catch everybody by surprise. Count the good mister. Count Mr. Big Leaguer as all in on Sam Howe. If it fails, I'll eat crow for it. Hey, all right. I, I hear that, man. I hear that. I'll say I'm about 75% there to be an all in. I need I need the rest of the training camp. If it goes how it's been going for, you know, the first couple of days, then I'll probably be at 102. Uh, but I definitely think, you know, the overall picture on Sam is, is incorrect. Uh, I think, you know, the Madden adjustments will be made after week one, probably after training camp. Because my man is much better than the 66. Like, I think that I think they rated my man way too low. Yeah, yeah, you know, he might be a – by the time it's all said and done, he might be an 80, bro, on the, on the mat. That's yeah, that's that's where I'm at. So, uh, is there anything else you wanted to get in real quick? I mean, we didn't talk too much defense, but, you know, camp is here, so. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll be, we'll be cranking out episodes this all season. We're going to bring it back this season for the people. Uh, hopefully we can get two or three episodes in a week and really get the people what they need. This is an exciting time to be a Commanders fan. Dan Snyder is gone. I'm wearing my merch again. I ain't wearing no skins. <laughs> I only wear my skins merch to the skins games, bro, because it's embarrassing. It's, I don't want to support this man. I don't want to keep giving money in his pocket, giving money to his pockets and showing that I am in public. You know what I'm saying? Nah. <laughs> now, now that he's gone, I'm wearing this hat everywhere, baby. I ain't taking it off since the Harris group came. I've been sleeping in this thing. <laughs> that was wild. 
Nah, I feel you though, man. I feel you, bro. Like the day it was sold, I went to work completely decked out in burgundy and gold. You would have thought I was going to a game because that's how it felt. So, Commanders fans out there, man, we're with y'all, man. We're with y'all. We're everybody's happy. Everybody's ecstatic, and I look forward to seeing a lot of y'all at camp, man. Maybe we could connect. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's get it, man. Let's get it. You know what time it is, baby. Hell, Hell to, to the, the culture. culture. <laughs>